Good evening and welcome to this week's edition of Faith to Faith. During this new series of programs, we'll be exploring the contemporary world of interfaith relations and its relevance in the 21st century. And we ask the big questions. Is peaceful coexistence really achievable when all faiths claim to have the truth? Why are sectarian conflicts between people of the same faiths so acrimonious? And is there an increasing secular militancy against faith-based lifestyles? We will look at the rise of so-called fundamentalist approaches to faith and investigate their impact on current perceptions of religion. We will also scrutinize the role of faith institutions, the media, the state, and corporations in shaping civil society's notion of what religion is. In a world which is both increasingly competitive and materialistic, and where resources are diminishing rapidly with rising economic uncertainty and no sign of reduction in poverty, how is faith taking on the challenge of dealing with the root causes of these problems? What are faith institutions doing about, say for instance, the continued exploitation and destruction of the environment? How are we dealing with infanticide, human rights violations, and the sale of arms, still one of the largest industries on the planet? It's not hard to conclude that we have a potential for increase in violence, war, conflict, and terror. Is there a role for interfaith activism on the world stage? The Interfaith Network for the UK says its way of working is firmly based on the principle that dialogue and cooperation can only prosper if they are rooted in respectful relationships which don't blur or undermine the distinctiveness of different religious traditions. And how do we do this in a Western world that is struggling to find its own identity whilst trying to understand the plethora of new faiths that have arrived in such large numbers over the past half century or so? This series will look at what answers faith communities have for these and other big issues directly affecting our everyday lives and the future of our children. Tonight, we will begin with a kaleidoscope of views from believers about their belief. We hear the outgoing Archbishop of Canterbury's thought for the day on interfaith engagement. And we host a lively studio discussion about the need for interfaith with the Reverend Dr. Marx Braybrook, Imam Sajid, and Molana Musharraf Hussein. And finally, we feature the first of our weekly Art of Faith performances. Nuri Sardar will be reciting a poetic eulogy in commemoration of the martyr of Islam, Imam Hussein al-Islam, the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And here are some of our faith activists and their reflections on their beliefs. It's one of the really extraordinary facts that the most influential human being who ever lived was somebody who commanded no armies, performed no miracles, had no mass of disciples, it was just an ordinary simple human being. His name was Abraham, his wife was Sarah, and today more than half of the world's population claim their descent, literal or metaphorical, from Abraham and Sarah. 2.2 billion Christians, 1.3 billion Muslims, and a few Jews. 13 million. And that is why the historic tensions, wars, conflicts between the three Abrahamic monotheisms are so tragic. We have one father, we have one mother, we are descended from the same parents, which means we are all brothers and sisters. And it's a very interesting story. If you look at the book of Genesis, which is about sibling rivalry, human Western history has been about the sibling rivalry, mainly between Christianity and Islam, with Jews getting caught in the middle. And if you look at Genesis, you will find it's all about brothers and the animosity between them. Cain and Abel, Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau, Joseph and his brothers, they look just like four stories, but actually there's a logic to them. And you can see that if you look at the last scene in each relationship. The last scene of Cain and Abel, Abel is lying dead. Fratricide, murder. Isaac and Ishmael, the last scene, 
they are standing together at Abraham's grave. Death, grief has brought them together. Jacob and Esau, well, they fear, Jacob fears that Esau is going to take revenge, but actually when they meet for the last time, they kiss, they embrace, and they go their separate ways. The last scene of Joseph and his brothers is a scene of forgiveness and reconciliation. Joseph tells them, I know you tried to kill me, I know you sold me as a slave, but for heaven's sake, atem chashavtem alai ra'ah, you plotted evil against me, valokim chashavalotova, but God turned it into good. He forgives them, and they live together in harmony. Now, if that is the story of Genesis, should that not become the story of the 21st century? We are Jacob and Esau, Joseph and his brothers. Forget about which is which. Jews, Christians, and Muslims are brothers and sisters. And the time has come to forgive one another and to find reconciliation. And we believe that God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses and the children of Israel um, in order for them to follow. We have three. We have morning, evening, and afternoon prayers that Jews should say. And they are varying lengths. They're usually only about 10 minutes long. I don't know if you've ever been on a plane and you've seen suddenly a group of Jews stand together and say the afternoon prayers together. It's about 10 minutes long. They come together and say the afternoon prayers because there's an idea that it's better you can say certain prayers when you're together as a minimal of eight people, eight men in Orthodox Judaism, which forms a community. The Qur'an, I mean, because it's a, a primary source to each and every Muslim, um, and particularly to myself as well, um, I would say I spend um, daily um, a connection with that. You find many uh, who travel with uh, travel Qur'an as well, wherever they go, it's, it's read, and that's something which is essential. So it's, it's, it's very much, it's a thing, it's a text which is very much beloved to the individual. It makes me feel very close to the Creator, because we are following the message which came down to Prophet Muhammad, who was illiterate who could not read nor he could write. And Quran is a very complicated book. So therefore, the Holy Quran is a book which is the word of God preserved from the time of Prophet Muhammad till today. And makes me feel very satisfied reading that. There are two particular Christian acts of worship that I, I love. Uh, at Christmas, uh, we celebrate the birth of Jesus, uh, which of course is um, also told in the Quran. Um, and uh, that's a lovely uh, occasion uh, to remind us that uh, we have uh, a direct connection with God and that God uh, is involved in the affairs of the world. That's a, one, a wonderful time. It's often been described that individuals have a direct line to God at any time. And we, in, we practice that in all sorts of different ways, not only in formal prayer services, private prayer services, in our study of the Torah itself. The Prophet Muhammad said that every um, community has its fest festivals. And um, for, so, for example, uh, you know, the Jews um, celebrate the, the New Year and, and the Passover especially, you know, the time when they, when they were saved from being killed. Um, the Christians uh, celebrate Christmas and Easter. Uh, they, they celebrate, in other words, the birth of Jesus and also the time when they think he was crucified. In fact, as Muslims, we believe that he wasn't crucified, but someone who looked like him. And according to the Gospel of Barnabas, that actually was um, the man who was going to betray him. He was made to look like Jesus and he was crucified. Um, but for the Muslims, our two festivals are the festival at the end of Ramadan, which is called the Eid al-Fitr, and the festival which marks the climax of the pilgrimage, which is called the, the Eid al-Adha. And these are our two festivals. We have a book called the Talmud, which was written down around about 500 CE. Um, so it's about 1500 years old already. And it's constructed through the years, it's been added to, and it's constructed like a conversation. Um, even on the page you can see the different voices having the conversation. They disagree with each other. Um, sometimes they don't even reach an answer. Um, and each generation adds to the page trying to make it relevant to their age and to understand it for their generation. Um, 
and I think it's an incredible testament to sort of the continual diversity that Judaism has always had um, that there's never been one way of being Jewish um, and that the, the sort of the authentic heart of Judaism lies in it being a constant discussion and conversation and there being no one true way. The Ten Commandments do have a place within Christianity. Let me begin with a reflection. It is important to change how we speak to one another, as I said, at the very deepest level. That is where I want to start in my reflection. How do we speak to one another at the deepest level? And I believe that we really begin to love our neighbors across the boundaries of religious division. When we learn to see the other person as a person to whom God is speaking. When I see another person and think that is a person to whom God is speaking, I see that that is a person that God, as we might say, God takes seriously. God thinks we are worth speaking to. Almighty God himself, in his infinite power and majesty and splendor, <coughs> thinks that you and I are worth speaking to. You and I are worth calling into his service. What a miracle, what an extraordinary vision that is, what a transforming picture that is of the world we live in, that you and I are thought by Almighty God to be worth speaking to. Now, when we see one another in that light, what a difference it makes. And sometimes, too, I have liked to say that real dialogue begins not so much when we speak face to face with each other, but when we see the face of our neighbor turned towards God. Then we see it. in its dignity and its beauty. And that is the vision that I have believed must be set before all of us in all our societies across the world. In this society, Pakistan, <coughs> wherever, there is difference. Because difference does not have to lead to division. It does not have to lead to bitterness. Uh, my name is Mohsin Abbas and today I have with me uh, three venerable guests coming from uh, a range of different views and opinions and schools of thought, but nonetheless united uh, where, the, where it counts, the heart. And the discussion is all about interfaith in Britain and the, we have with us some of the pioneers of interfaith dialogue in Britain and we're very fortunate to have uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Marcus Braybrook uh, Imam Sajid and Molana Sharif Hussain. Thank you. I've so got the exact right name. So, uh, eminent scholars in their own rights uh, and activists, not just scholars sitting behind desks, but people who do things, which uh, which is is always heartening to see. But uh, I'm going to get the ball rolling with uh, with Marcus. Uh, it, we were talking earlier on as well about um, the need for interfaith. Why do we need interfaith dialogue? Well, I sure think it's fairly obvious that um, religious violence is a cause of real suffering and often death in different parts of the world. So I think the primary thing is to break down prejudice and ignorance and to bring together the moral values that people of faith share in the sort of search for peace. Um, so as the negative of getting rid of the distortions, the misunderstandings, getting people to meet, building up friendship. Then I think secondly, the common action, because the major issues that face our world, such as the environment or poverty of so many people, are issues that face all humanity, not just one particular faith. And then I think thirdly, there's the spiritual enrichment that can come. I certainly know, from learning something about Islam, it's actually deepened also my Christian faith and understanding. Um, and I think there is an area which one moves Yes, just beyond understanding to a real sense of spiritual fellowship. Fantastic. Well, I'm sorry, the Prophet, peace be upon him, did he engage with interfaith uh, dialogue? The centre of uh, Prophet Sallallahu activity was with people. People of different background, though originally in Mecca he was facing 
Quraysh, but later on he continued. For me, the starting point is that Quran is a guidance for the whole mankind. It's not for Muslims only, as some people unfortunately think about it. And also, Prophet peace be upon him was rahma for the alamin, for the whole world and all mankind. And commandment of Quran is that ta'alu ila kalamatan sawaum bayna wa baynakum. Bring diverse people together and face what the commonality and common action you have. And the most important thing is the action. Quran says that you must speak gently. You know, qulu lil nas husna. And it also says, go and work with other. Ta'awun ala al birri wa taqwa. Cooperation on good thing. And these all bring to different faith, different uh, uh, common actions, as Marcus has rightly said it. And without that, because this is the age of cooperation, this is the age of partnership, and that what comes from Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's own example, and also Ahl al-Bayt's example, how they preached during the time, all am and scholars, all have been working with all people without any differentiation, because God has created us in difference, and commanded us to overcome your differences and respect each other, accept each other, value your diversity and celebrate your differences. Without that, we are not human being. Because best human being among you are those from who other get benefit. And that is what the message of interfaith and intrafaith is all about. Well, on that point, I'm going to come on to Mushar Sab. You, you are an active intrafaith dialogue uh, advocate and uh, within Christianity we have hundreds of denominations maybe I'm wrong with the hundreds but there's <laughs> certainly several that I know <laughs> we have lots of denominations uh, and uh, and pathways within Islam as well where people find uh, they follow different mujtahids different imams different mm -hmm. schools of thought uh, what's been your experience on intrafaith dialogue you know actually uh, the world is uh, turning into a global village now mm -hmm. the distances they are shrinking People, they're getting closer, the, the ethnic backgrounds, geographical backgrounds, the distances and uh, differences which were there, they're on the reduction side now. They're reducing, you know, they're, they're getting closer to each other. So this is a time for uh, different faiths, also, obviously, as we are living in the same, well, we are sharing the same earth and the sh same globe. So it's uh, obvious that we are also coming closer to each other. And uh, now everybody is feeling uh, a necessity of different schools of thought to come and uh, share their values, their teachings with each other and uh, come to the point where we, we are naturally and originally every mankind wants to know where we are coming from, where we are heading, mm. and what is our aim and objective of life, which our religion tells us. Mm. And it has got the information, and we can, everybody is searching for those informations. So the experiences, different schools of thought of different religions, they are having, they are, this is the time, I think the time is right because of their uh, advancement in knowledge, in wisdom, and in understanding. Now the mankind is uh, heading towards a point where we are going to share our uh, knowledge, our wisdom, our experiences with other people to find out the reality and truth of the universe and the creator of the universe. On that, that, that note of globalism, Marcus, yeah. uh, I'm conscious that modern communication methods, uh, social media, the internet, uh, vast media expansion across the world has made it a global village and information is more accessible as, as uh, Molana said uh, to individuals people can do their own research in in light of all this overdose of information mm. is that also one of the reasons why uh, people with good intention uh, with good at research uh, with sound based views should be more active in terms of uh, communicating because quite often this social media or this, this, this new medium of communication can be hijacked by extremists, by people who don't want people to come together and quite often you're seeing that in conflicts precipitating around the world at all sorts of levels. Uh, firstly my question is how does faith deal with modern social media and what's, what's, the, uh, what's, what's the obligation there? And then I'll move on to uh, the wider question that I had in my mind. 
Well, I think, I mean, it has great opportunities and great dangers. And I think people, when the printing press was invented, had just the same arguments about it. I mean, it's how you use, use it. And obviously you can use it to spread message of goodwill or of hate. And I found it I mean, extremely valuable in terms of international interfaith work. And very often, if there's a situation, a problematic situation, I would tend to say to people in Palestine or so on, a, mess a message of support, but we really can be, be helpful. And I gave you another example. Uh, we had a friend, Bishop, in Chiapas region in Mexico, and there was a human rights abuse. And he managed to let us know that there was a paramilitary killed about 50 people. He let us know. And a group that I belonged to, a peace council around the world, we were able to highlight it and brought pressure on the government of Mexico actually to take some action rather than just sort of try and bury it and pretend it ha hadn't happened. And so there are all sorts of ways of support. And there's a new online interfaith journal the Interfaith Observer, which is a great means of communication because I think it can ensure that we actually support each other um, and also perhaps um, show that the negative image which is sometimes portrayed is only that, that of a minority. But I do think we need to be watchful and counter um, the Islamophobia, the anti-Semitism and the sort of hate which some people are putting out. Well, that, that's, a, that's a really fascinating kind of response. I, I'm interested in these stereotypes, Imam Sajid. Stereotypes in this day and age, if people have them and they put them out there, and the media has a, does have a habit of putting out labels and sound bites, in a world of sound bites, uh, what, what sort of actions have you seen that are positive from the interfaith community which counter those uh, the easy knee-jerk stereotypes about Muslims being bombers or Christians being people just of uh, love and peace and harmony. I mean, these are stereotypes that, that are out there. Believers have a duty to use the medium of media to promote common good. It has a commandment that we must try to show our solidarity at the time of distress, at the time of difficulties, at the time of being victimhood of any stereotyping of any kind, like Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. We have to work together in order to combat and address those issues. Medium is not only, as mentioned, dangers, but it can be used as a positive opportunity to promote something which we all want in our society, peace, harmony, love, compassion, care, and so many other things. And faith believers have more duty because they come from moral values. They have a strong and strength, and that if they can promote it, within their own community, in their own congregation, or even with the other partners, Christian, Jews, Muslims, and others, then it, it can be furthers the society in which we're living, and that will create a positive image in the world we live. Mohana, let's move on to another very important dialogue. We, we've talked about intrafaith and interfaith dialogue. What about the dialogue between faith mindset, people from a faith-based uh, faith mindset, and those who are secular-minded? What, what are your experiences and what are your, your uh, suggestions for that? Perhaps? Actually, uh, uh, the boundaries are not very well defined. You don't say that here, mm -hmm. these people, they are secular, these are religious-minded, mm -hmm. these are different. But the thing is that... Uh, uh, three important things that, uh, that happened and are happening in the present age. One is the media boom. Because of the media boom, you know, first of all, in the previous times, if something was said in one corner of the world, that other corner never used to listen to that even after years. Mm. Now, if anything is said, the Instant. same moment, whole world knows that and uh, everybody knows. The communication uh, gap has uh, uh, vanished away and uh, it's uh, very well communicated community as a human being, as we say that. Mm. That's one thing. Number two, uh, the religions that were uh, just uh, uh, confined to some practices, now people are judging what effect it, the religion will have on my personal life, mm. my behavior, my attitude, my movement, my mm. link with other human beings, with other religions. Mm. So people are probing those uh, mm. uh, venues also. Mm. The religion is taking over on mm. one side. Mm. On the other side, secular, uh, there's no secular mindset, I don't think. Mm. Even the secular person have got some belief where he's coming from, where he's heading, and what is his aim and objective. And these answers to these questions define a religion. So they also have got something in their mind. But there's one more 
uh, uh, we can say a more another circle of the materialistic people who mm. think that matter is everything and we need to accumulate wealth mm. and by hook or by crook they don't have any values because religious gives you some boundaries this is what you can do and this is what you can't do the religion tells you about do's and don'ts a person having no religion have no boundaries they can do anything to accumulate wealth and these are this materialistic thinking and thought of the people this group of people whatever is coming out whether that's in the form of terrorism whether islamophobia or mm. anything else all these strings are tied tied to this uh, framework of this mindset so this is a thing which all the religions they need to get together and face this in whichever religious form they comes i don't say that uh, they are a sheep which are doing that they mm. are wolf in the sheep's skin and they are doing they're trying to put themselves sometimes religious people sometimes belonging to an ethnic background or a geographical background this mindset can only be faced by all the religion the mindset which believe in religion which believe in the creator they get together and this can be abolished and this mindset can be put on the back seat if we try well, such as you have having reason. worked with europe and coming and going to france you get a hardcore definition of secularism laicity but within our own governments local governments and national governments especially in whole europe they say we are not religious we are secular that's where secularism basically coming from majority of citizens in britain or in many other part of the world they have a faith in themselves even secularism have some moral values on citizenship or even core value of understanding and respecting and tolerance and so many other thing so we do not have a dispute with those ideas at all what we have a dispute with fundamental secularist who are against all faiths they actually wanted to catch christianity because of the previous uh, what we call controversy of uh, church and state but nowadays it has been come down and ordinary people say no no i'm not a religious person i'm a secular person it's a just as a show base it's a just a showing off it's not a strong feeling but i do agree with dr mishar hussain that real thing is this how faithful people be- behave when i came in this country in 72 my concern was does this modern secularist accept believers right to have a space in public square or not that we won after 20 years of debating with archbishops and many many others even today i'm attending a meeting where award has been given to archbishop of canterbury uh, uh, for interfaith work and that's really something we promoted it and we worked with professor s akbar and many many others and that things have to be recognized that religious people have come forward to the work with all and that's what we have to work with secularists like governments officials and others who distance themselves from religion we have to bring them together that we are common human being and we need to respect each other accept each other as we are don't label us into a boxes but treat us as a citizen and respect our differences so that we can work together Marcus it's a it's a fascinating area this the old days when i first came across interfaith as a young person i always thought about thought about people who were uh, in their post 50s having cups of tea and coffee and biscuits and all telling telling each other how terribly nice they were and then walk away and um and and uh, do it again perhaps the next time but they were a, a, a small group of people who were particularly had had a crossover the la- the vast majority of people had nothing to do with interfaith and there is this tendency still about parallel communities in britain mm-hmm. uh, we've got issues where communities are built up by nature in certain areas uh, and are all from the same community the same area same yeah. religion yeah. so that these these issues about parallel communities the old concept of interfaith it seems like times are changing interfaith could be a, a tool for dealing with conflict um mm-hmm. conflict transformation or conflict resolution it sounds to me like the tea and biscuits are out and it's going to be uh, roll up the sleeves time and and do something practical do you oh, think okay. that's where where christianity islam and judaism and other faiths are, are think, heading now yeah i think this is where we've always wanted to get to mm. but um people don't start doing anything together until we've actually met each other that's true. and you have to allow time 
for, fr for friendship to build up, for trust, really. Mm. And, you know, it's, it's probably better if people are polite than impolite when they first meet. But um, as you go on, you can s sort of talk about differences and share them and know that if you do disagree, it's not that you're attacking a person or attacking their religion. It's a genuine uh, seeking. But I think you're right. It's the areas of cooperation. And I think this sort of effect of, of violence in mm. our society of terrorism mm. has made it re really urgent. But there are also the areas of sort of unemployment and, uh, and I mean, the Three Phase Four I'm involved in is doing a lot of work in, in the schools and also mm. with young people. And then, of course, sport is increasingly one in which people of different faith communities uh, c can, can come together. Mm. And I was heard about this interesting thing from um, Palestine, Israel, where they, they got a group of Israelis and mm. Palestinians together yes. to, to play a football match. And then just before the start, they said five Palestinians were going to play with six Israelis on one team, and uh, six you know, all the way around. And suddenly they found they had to be working with people they thought were their opponents. So <laughs> there are all sorts of these practical ways. Yeah, that, it, it, I mean, these are lovely practical examples that you're showing. And I, I'm kind of, uh, I'm, I really, we ought to hand you guys an award for blazing the trail, because now it's something so relevant in the world. And uh, um, I think there's going to be more and more of it. What would, what would you say... Uh, well, I'm not sure if again, actually, let me start with Marcus on this one, because one of the things that I really admire about Christianity, certainly in Britain, is that you've got all these denominations, yet somehow there is still dialogue which is quite amicable. I mean, you probably, you might pull me up on this and say something <laughs> totally different. I do find that, conversely, amongst Muslims, <coughs> we, we do tend to get a little bit shirty. And it's lovely to see somebody who's of the Ahli Hadith, uh, Sunnah Wal Jamaat, sitting with somebody who's from the Jafri school of thought and, and very comfortable. Quite often, amongst religions, there's more uh, knee-jerk fear or threat or anger or um, sense of st stereotype. And, and, that concerns me as well, because we see in Pakistan, for instance, the killing of uh, Sufi Sunnis or sort of whatever, or, or Shias yeah. or whatever. And there's killings by people who are advocating religion and they do pray and they do their Salah and everything. And they do their, uh, their, their, their Ramadan, their, their, their fasting, etc. I.e. they do their rituals, yet it still seems to be OK to be intolerant. I mean, where, where do we tackle this kind of hard issue? You know, how do you how do you go about dealing with this kind of intrafaith kind of suspicion and hatred as well? Well, I mean, some of you have noticed that the Church of England doesn't entirely agree about women bishops, so uh, we all have our uh, have our differences. And I think, but increasingly, Christians have got to know each other, working together, uh, sharing values. And what we're seeing is what we share is more important than our, our differences. But I suppose the problem is the people who are absolutely sh sure they are right. And for me, faith is about trusting God, the living God, which is much more like a personal relationship, rather than signing on. You know, the creeds point to, to that. Um, and where we get stuck is thinking that particular view, that particular verse of scripture, is the one which is absolutely right. And really, it's just not using our reason, not thinking, not, not, not having a living dialogue with God, but just using quotes. Well, traditionally, uh, Mushroff, we've got evangelical uh, religions here. Islam wants followers. It says we're right. Christianity traditionally has said we have the truth, and it, it recruits. Judaism doesn't. Judaism is slightly different in that regard. The, an exclusive. So, yeah, they're exclusive. We are chosen they're, people. Yeah, so. they're, they're chosen. But we, we, we try to recruit. Now, how do you balance that idea of, look, we're right and come to us at the expense of others and still create tolerance? Uh, actually, it's, um, if we uh, take it other ways, although Judaism doesn't, uh, they said they are chosen people and they don't, uh, uh, but they, even then they need yeah. to tell the other human beings what their teachings are, what true, are true. the teachings of Judaism. So that's the preaching. Absolutely. Uh, you know, before that, this uh, question never used to rise about five years back or 10 years or 20, 50 years back, you know. Now the time has come, as mm. I was saying, that we are advancing with our wisdom, with our education, with our level of tolerance increasing. We are increasing, to, moving towards a point where different religions, in my opinion, they should present their teachings. True to the coming generations mm. and tell them this is our 
religion, mm -hmm. and we shouldn't mind if somebody, uh, you know, accepts uh, other teachings or doesn't accept the teachings. It's a, 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 because the Creator has left us with an open option. Mm -hmm. We are to decide that I want to act or not. Even mm -hmm. Islam says, La ikraha It's yeah. not something compulsion mm -hmm. on you that you should accept it, and if you don't accept it, mm -hmm. uh, you're 124,000 prophets and messengers from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. None of, not a single one of them was intolerant towards the teaching. They used to come and وَمَا عَلَيْنَا إِلَّا الْبَلَاغُ Our duty is only to mm. tell you, inform you, mm. preach to you what are the teachings and to accept or not to accept, mm. it's entirely up to you. So that thing, if we adopt that in our religion, that we give our religious teachings, what are our social aspects, economic aspects as a, as a religion, what you benefit, your moral values and other mm. things. Mm. And your most important, the aim and objective of our religion mm. is to create a link between the creation and the creator. True. That's what we need to present. And if you present that and leave it to the people, I don't think there's going to be um, in, in educated people. And most of these things that are happening, as I said in my, uh, in my uh, answer to a previous question, this is not the religions which are intolerant. Mm. They are intolerant of people who want to create this intolerance. And we should be on the guide of that, that I want to present my point of view. Like you said, we, are, um, we follow three different religions mm. and three schools of thought. And uh, we are sitting together. I am mm. presenting my uh, opinion. The other, uh, my brothers, they are presenting their opinions. And we left it to the audience to listen to these values. This mm. is a very educated and a human way to pass on our knowledge, experience, and other things to the other values to other people. I think there is a need to have an intra-faith because that's where our trust and confidence will be cementing. And then we will be promoting a better image of humanity. Um, of course, individually, we have to represent honestly what we believe in and what we practice. But collectively, we have to find some common actions and common grounds in order to move forward the society and civilization where we are so that the violence which we earlier were talking about could be addressed better. Ittihad al-Ulama is one way, Council of Christians and Jews another way, Shia Sunnis scholars have to meet and also we have to go, on, go on to the down to the earth to go to our own congregation to preach love and care for each other. Without that, the uh, world will not be peaceful. Well, we have to get rid of the barriers which are separating. Absolutely. It's a, it's a brilliant solution. Can I just solutions. come back on the, Please, uh, you said the truth. Yeah. It seems to me what really matters is true living, not slogans. Um, Jesus said, um, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Or well, true religion is to visit the widow and the orphan in their distress. I, mean, I think we need to get away from that sense of truth as um, something intellectual, where what really matters is how do we find a true way of living. Well, I'm going to give everybody one comment. We're right at the end of the yeah. program, and uh, I'm going to, um, within one minute each, I'd like probably to get a summary uh, of, of what your thoughts are about the discussion we've had, but more importantly, we're coming to two very auspicious uh, dates. We've got the birth of Christ, uh, Christmas, and we've got the birth of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, peace be upon both. And it seems to me that here we've got an opportunity of celebrating two of the most beautiful characters uh, that have ever lived. And I mean, that's undeniable in terms of their benefit and their sort of the, the, the positive impact they've had on, on, on civilization, on creating civilizations. And the Christian world and the Muslim world, evangelical they may have been, but some really encouraging comments and discussions about uh, working together and moving together, but, but I'm going to leave it on this. Uh, what do you think that uh, Muslims uh, can do to share in Christmas, and what could Christians do to share in, in Eid Milad al Nabi? What could we do in terms of starting some sort of movement which, which helped us to share the birth of these two, two great figures? For me, all prophets are the example and best model for the whole mankind. Same as Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Uswa Hasana, and also the Prophet Jesus also is a model. What he did, Jesus in his time, evaluated the dignity of the mankind, asking anyone who has not committed any sin, come forward and throw first stone. 
and we know what the history has said later. Prophet Peace Bible says that Khairun Nas Mayan Fanas, best among you are those who help other, who serve other selflessly. And that's the model which we need to bring it in our world today. And these two celebrations should go to their teachings and then actions by their followers, not only words but actions. Marcus, your summary. Well, well I think um, Imam said about the Quran being a message for all humankind, and I'm thinking of the words of the angels, peace and goodwill to all people. True. And I think all of us can see in Jesus an example of humility and service, and the story of um, a child born in a manger should make us aware of, of the homeless. And in fact, I think we're already finding many of our schools have solved this problem of how to celebrate different festivals. and. Um, and of course, the enjoying thing is to share in each other's delicacies. I was eating some latka from the uh, Kanuka, the Jewish community, last night. We've got wonderfully good food to share, and we've also got lots of good ideas. Food brings it together anyway. <laughs> well, uh, well your, your conclusion on this idea of uh, celebration? And of, of you know, uh, this celebration, obviously, uh, these religions, which we have got the same, we have got string tied to the same source. Mm. That's our creator. No doubt, yes. no doubt. So we are already tied. If you've got pebbles, mm. you tie them with different strings and yeah. throw them away. Yeah. And if you hold it in one hand and pull them, mm. two actions will happen. Yeah. Number one, those pebbles will come towards you. Number two, they will get closer to each other. Yeah. So if you concentrate on this single point, yeah, I think that closer to if you concentrate other. on this thing, mm. leaving other, there are they, there are thousand differences between me and my son. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and there are millions of commonalities between me and my son. So we should, if we have got such a big, as I said, that religion's aim and objective to create a link between the creation and the creator. Yeah. And we, if we start on from this very point, I think the difference they will get away. Number one. Number two, I'll just point out one more very important thing, which is a commonality between, at least between Christians and the Muslims. We, as a Muslims, all the schools of thought, they yeah. believe in coming back of Imam Mahdi. No doubt. Who is a subordinate of Imam, uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we, as Muslims, also believe in the coming back of Jesus, Jesus. Christ. Yes. That will. Jesus Christ will come back. And that will be the same time mm. when both of them will be working together yeah. for making the global kingdom of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mm. or God, whatever we call it. Kingdom That's of God. That means that the whole humanity. Mm. And then Allah... In our Quran, in the very first ayah, he said, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Praises for the Allah, who is the Great nourisher, Allah. provider, and lawmaker of the whole universe. Mm -hmm. Alameen, universes. Mm -hmm. And he says, Wama arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alameen. I didn't send you, O Prophet, but as a blessing for the universes. Mm, so we it. should come out from this small circle of me, mm. my school of thought, my religion. We should come and start thinking globally as is the oh, message of Jesus Christ and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we, if we come out of that thing, inshallah. On, on that very, very uh, global note, um, We've had a fantastic discussion. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you ever so much, gentlemen, for coming in. And I look forward to inviting you to further faith-to-faith -faith, uh, dialogues and hope you'll be also invite other colleagues and friends mm -hmm. and encourage mm -hmm. them to join this, this debate. Um, viewers, I hope you've enjoyed uh, the discussion as much as I have. Uh, until next, uh, the next edition of Faith to Faith, uh, look forward to seeing you all. And Merry Christmas. To all the Christians, Happy Christmas too, yeah. and 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 also to for Eid Milad and Nabi. Yeah. Well, it's a bit early, but <laughs> nonetheless, uh, you know, uh, salutations and peace. Be seasonal upon. Seasonal greetings. Yeah, seasonal greetings. I think that's the right right word, Imam Sajid. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, look forward to seeing you at, uh, in our next edition. His confusion asks, is there a symbol or a perfect guide? From whom does patience learn? Is there a symbol or a perfect guide? A voice he hears speaks to him of calamity. A voice he hears speaks to him of calamity. He asks, is it my conscience or my insanity? Is it my conscience or my insanity? The voice replies, narrating to a mind for wisdom thirsty, and the voice says, oh man, don't your hardships carry an essence of beauty?
Don't your hardships carry an essence of beauty? If you're eager for reward, why fall towards sin? Embedded fear from punishment burns temptation. Difficulties can be bared with contemplation. Recall death and recall the grave that you shall reside in. Better than your patience, is there a symbol or a perfect guide? From whom does patience learn? Is there a symbol or a perfect guide? Who is this sweet voice that penetrates this man's heart? Who is this sweet voice that penetrates this man's heart? Which saint has mastered patience's intricate art? Which saint has mastered patience's intricate art? For he's attached to this man. Refusing to part, the man cries, voice, tell me your name before you depart. The man cries, oh voice, tell me your name before you depart. The voice tells him, I am time's ever burning flame. I am time's ever burning flame. And eternal are lessons that stem from my name. Since I glared at tragedy, when to me it came, the name Hussein, a symbol for mankind became. I am time's ever burning flame. And eternal are lessons that stem from my name since I glared at tragedy when to me it came the name Hussein a symbol for mankind became the name Hussein a symbol for mankind became tell them I am Hussein tell them I am Hussein when souls are searching for a perfect guide from whom does patience learn is there a symbol or a perfect guide